this is uh, Good Shepherd Sunday, and it's also the Sunday where we're talking about faith, and as we get through our little discussion here, I think you'll see how nicely the idea of faith and a shepherd uh, with sheep actually is, uh, helps to help us understand what, what faith really is. I have to tell you that I'm, I'm getting kind of tired of these big topics that I mean, faith is like, well, just preach a sermon on Christianity. You know, tell us what the whole thing is in 20 or 30 minutes. It's, it's, a, little, it's, a, it's a daunting task. So I'm looking forward after this, we'll get to some variables or something. Uh, but for now, when Paul gives us this. He says there's uh, three basic things. So now, these, so now faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. And we did, we've done love and we've done hope. And now we're doing faith. Faith is what we're talking about today. And so we're going we're gonna to kind of bounce around and say what faith isn't and what it is. And kind of get a handle on what this life of faith thing is. Because all sorts of people will tell you, you just got to have faith. You got to have a life of faith. That kind of thing. But what does that mean? Because sometimes that drives me nuts. I don't even know. that. What does that mean to have faith? Is it... Have faith for what? Have faith in whom? Whom? Not who. Right, Don? Yeah. I got my grammar notes back there. To be honest. So the first thing we want to we want to honor and recognize about when we talk about faith, we are not talking about things that we uh, can touch, see, taste, or accurately predict. I don't if if I if I let go of this remote, which I'm not going to do, I don't have to have faith that that's going to fall to the floor. I know it's going to fall to the floor because that's gravity. That doesn't require any faith at all. It's the way it always operates. And if nothing interferes, that's going to fall to the floor. Faith is about things that that operate in places we can't see. Faith is about things that operate in ways that we can't predict. That's what the Bible says. Faith concerns that which is unseen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And so when we talk about faith, we're talking about, we're, we're already stepping into the area that makes me personally uncomfortable and makes a lot of people uncomfortable is that area of unknown, of gray, of, of not black and white. This is, this is the future, this is things that we can't measure or test in ways that we modern people like to measure and test things. Now faith, uh, so faith is concerned with, with, with the future and all this stuff, but we, faith is not fatalism. And, and I, I, um, I have heard uh, people accuse people of faith simply being fatalistic. Fatalism means that uh, that all whatever will be will be. It's sort of a deterministic universe. It's like, well, whatever is going to happen is going to happen, and I just, you know what, I'm going to not worry about it. That's not really faith. To say, well, whatever is going to happen is going to happen. I'm not going to worry about it. Faith is not fatalism. Although it can look very much like fatalism, because a person of faith can also say, I'm not going to worry about it. But they say, I'm not going to worry about it for a very different reason. Uh, the, the fatalistic person says, well, you know, that's whatever's going to happen is going to happen, and I just, there's no point in worrying about it. It's true enough. But the person of faith has the additional component of the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And so the person of faith also sees their life as in the hands of, of the Creator God who loves us so much that He sent Jesus to die for our sins to make us right with Him so He could be our Father, not just our Judge. So faith, faith definitely accepts things, but it doesn't accept things, accept things because of that's just the way it is. It accepts things because we understand there is a loving God at work in the world. And the Bible, the Bible paints, paints faith as... A picture of, in, you can have faith as inaction, 
as a refusal to get tied up in, in all the, hum, the, 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 the must do, the must change, the must control. Psalm 27 verse 14 says, wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage, and wait for the Lord. For a person of faith, there certainly is a time where their, their, their strong, active faith will look to an outsider like inaction, like a refusal to be involved in your own future. On the other hand, faith is definitely not inaction. If we go back to Hebrews 11 and, and look at the, all the, uh, the, the heroes of faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, do, those of you who are familiar with their lives, do their lives, do they seem like quiet people of inaction to you? Does Moses seem like a quiet person of inaction? No. He's, they, they, when, when Hebrews 11 goes through these people's lives, it says they acted in faith. They acted in faith. Their actions showed that they trusted God, the Good Shepherd. And so faith, faith is not fatalism. Faith is understanding and, it, and, and, and that, that God is working. Sometimes that means waiting. Sometimes that means doing. But it's not just, it's not just oh, you know, que sera, sera, whatever it will be, will be. Faith is also not pretending things are not the way they are. Sometimes it can seem like the the like faith is sometimes and, and, and sometimes people uh, the reason I'm closing my eyes is because this is what people do sometimes. And they think this is being faithful. They close their eyes to reality and say, This is not what is, this is not what is, this is not what is. Because I have faith, because I believe. And that's not really faith either. Philip Yancey, one of my favorite authors who struggles a lot with the tensions uh, of, of Christian life. When he was growing up, uh, he used to go to these uh, healing services with a friend of his. And, uh, and here's what would happen, is they'd go to a, a tent or a gym or whatever it was, and the, the leader, you know, they'd play loud music and all that stuff, and, 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 and things would get pumping, and the leader would be preaching and yelling, and get everybody fired up, and then they'd start to the command to heal in Jesus' name, and, and people come forward, and, and, and oh, it was just amazing. It was a wonderful experience. And this is what Philip noticed that his friend who wore glasses, he'd go up there and he'd go, he'd, he'd proclaim healing in Jesus' name. And he'd take his glasses off, and he would be healed in Jesus' name. And what Mr. Yancey noticed is that he never actually got rid of his glasses. He put them in his pocket. <laughs> and when he left the service, he took them out of his pocket and put it back on. You know, I fully believe in the healing power of God when God wants to heal. When? When God wants to heal, right? Because our ultimate de God, God wants to take us home eventually. The, the ultimate healing God wants is for us to live with Him forever in redeemed bodies, not in these broken down, sorry, pieces of equipment we have to walk around with now. Witness my voice, right? <laughs> so, so faith is not... It, 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 when you have faith, you don't have to like... You don't have to ignore what's really in front of your eyes. Faith is a way to look at what's really in front of your eyes, not pretend what is, is not. Faith is not directed by you. A lot of the faith talk we hear, it, it, it almost sounds like faith, faith, is, faith is a power that, that if we possess it rightly, it will get us what we want. If you have enough faith, you know, and you put it in the blank, whatever it is there. <clears throat> here's what, here's what uh, uh, Jesus said in uh, John. Uh, when he was talking about his life. Now, Jesus, I would say, is the ultimate life of faith, connection and trust with the Father, and, and committing everything into the Father's hands. Here's Jesus said, Truly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. 
And so in Jesus' life of faith, it wasn't the power for Jesus to do whatever he wanted. It was that Jesus was always in line with the Father's will. And this is an interesting thing. In, in the Gospel of John, there's, there's, uh, there's like, you know, nouns and verbs and things. Um, and, and there's a noun, faith, and there's the verb, like, believe in. And, and one of the things that the Gospel of John, when, when it was written, there was a, 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 a misconception of faith called Gnosticism. And, and one of the things that, that, that was, Gnosticism was this like, big, wide, esoteric sort of amalgam of religion the way people want it. So it's hard to put a finger on it. But one of the things was, was sort of a sense of, it, of the universe bows down to people of enlightenment. And so they might even use the, the idea of, you just got to have faith. You just got to have faith. Because you've heard this now, right? You've heard, you've heard uh, 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 motivational speakers and, and all those people say, you just got to have, believe it and become it, right? That kind of thing. You just got to have faith. But they never say faith in what or faith in what. You just got to have faith. And well, there's, a, there's an earthly truth to that for sure. I mean, what, if you believe you can or you believe you can't, that's probably true. Whichever you believe. But that's not what the, the Bible's not telling us that. And in the Gospel of John, John never once uses faith as a noun. It's always believe in. In fact, the interesting thing is the way John writes, probably because he's writing against this kind of just sort of generic believe and become, is he writes believe into, not just one. But into, the, 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 there's a bunch of different prepositions in Greek. And one of them is like actually going inside. And that's the way John writes about belief mostly, is believe into. Picture like a big, a giant marshmallow. And, 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 and you're, you're trying to think of how John talks about belief. And if he, believe into is like you diving straight into the center of this big, that's believe into. That's what John says. It's a, it's a believe into God. It's believe into Jesus. It's a life that's just like oh, you're stuck in the middle of all the God stuff. And, and that certainly is not a, a life directed by you. It's a life directed by God. So faith isn't something that accomplishes what... Faith is not something that accomplishes what we want. Faith is a trust to follow God and what God has for us. Faith is not, faith is not what you believe about God. This is, a, this, is a, this is an important distinction. Faith is not what you believe about God. James says in chapter 2, verse 19, this very point, he says, you believe there's one all-powerful God? Very good. Even the demons believe there's one all-powerful God and shudder, right? Because they're freaked out and scared, as well they should be. So, faith is not what you believe about God. That there is a God, that's not faith. Faith is about your relationship with, <coughs> with God, the way you look to God. This is faith. Faith is entrusting all to God. Faith is entrusting all to God. Jesus talks about this in so many different ways. One of the ways he's, he talks about this faith being actually entrusting all to God is about losing your life. It, it, the, the emphasis is not on life, it's on the your. Losing your life. For whoever would lose, would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his... See, there's life on both sides of that equation. It's his. Whoever loses his life for my sake of the gospel, will save it. Faith is entrusting all to God. That's what faith is. I'm going to read you a definition of faith from the New Bible Dictionary because I thought it was pretty good. Faith means abandoning all trust in one's own resources. Not abandoning your resources and that kind of thing, but all to trust in them. Faith means casting oneself unreservedly on the mercy of God. Faith means laying hold on the promises of God in Christ, relying entirely on the finished work of Christ for salvation. 
and on the power of the indwelling Spirit of God for daily strength. Faith implies complete reliance on God and full obedience to God. Faith into God. You just dive into God. That's what faith is. Seeing your whole life <coughs> as, as sort of surrounded by, engulfed in God. And this faith has a lot of benefits. There's, there's things that faith brings to our lives. Faith, the Bible says, gives us courage. Faith gives us courage. 2 Corinthians 5. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We acknowledge, we acknowledge that we have to walk through this life by faith. We don't see we don't physically see the hand of God working even though we perceive it from time to time. We don't physically see it. We're here in the body. We're away from the Lord. Not in the, you know, I know God's everywhere. But because we acknowledge this, we're not, we don't, faith is not walking around with blinders on it. It's an open-eyed acknowledgement that we walk in this area where we trust God in ways that we can't see. But this gives us good courage in the face of all the the horrible, difficult, crazy, confusing uh, things that we face in our life. Faith also brings peace. Faith brings peace. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith brings peace. And there is no peace greater than knowing that you have peace with God. Faith is entrusting all to God. And when, when you really, if you find yourself in anxiety or worry, the very first thing you should do is not try and solve it. Not that action isn't part of what we have to do in life. But the first response should be to pause for prayer. To commit the situation, whatever it is that is, 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 is pulling on your mind, to pause and commit that to God. Say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk through this in faith. I don't know whether God's going to do something outside. I don't know whether God's going to do something inside. I don't know whether God's going to, uh, you know, use this horrible situation to move me across the country. I mean, who knows? Who knows? Faith doesn't know. Faith trusts. But when you pause to pray and lay the situation before God, what you will find is what the Bible describes as the peace that passes all understanding. Which again is a faith thing. It's what? It's beyond understanding. And we just acknowledge that right up front. People who don't have faith, people who haven't committed their ways to the Lord, are going to say, why are you so calm? That doesn't make any sense at all to me. And what's your response? It doesn't make any sense to me either. It's beyond understanding. But I expect it. Because that's what the Bible says when I commit my way, commit, take my anxieties to God, He's going to trade me. He says, I got, I got an awesome deal for you. You hand your anxieties to me, and I will hand peace to you. That seems like a pretty good deal to me. That's the deal of faith. Peace that passes all understanding. Because we walk by faith and not by sight. And by the way, for those of you who feel like uh, like I do many times, like my faith is pretty small, and I and I sometimes you feel guilty about it because I, I might have the weakest faith in the room. Um, faith is a gift. The Bible says that even the measure of our faith is something that God hands out in different proportions, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. And in First Corinthians, Paul writes, "To some he is given faith by the same Spirit; to another, gives a feeling." It's a so even the, the faith we have is a gift, a gift from God. So we have this faith, which is entrusting our entire lives to God. And, and God has demonstrated to us that He is worthy of our trust. Because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were powerless to reach out to God, God reached out to us in the person of Jesus Christ. The only way that God could possibly make the only this is a this is a being who who spoke the universe into creation this is when we say 
I mean, we, we throw the word God off just like this. I mean, really, our knees should turn to jelly just, uh, just when we stop and think about God. Because the, 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 uh, the enormity, uh, we're just... How do, you do, how do you describe the indescribable? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, um, oh, wow. There's a loss of What was I talking about? Thanks. Thanks so much. The enormity of God. I was like, yeah, I remember that. I think my brain turned it. Maybe my sermon's done. No, no, no. I'm not quite. So it. it God has demonstrated to us that his the core of his heart for us, this God we could never hope to understand in his full existence, has demonstrated to us that the core of his heart is love. And he has done that, the Bible says, by coming in the person of Jesus Christ. That The, the Bible says that in Jesus the fullness of the deity dwelt. And you know what Jesus said? Greater love has no man than this, that he give up his life for his friends. And so if you want to see the heart of God, you look at Jesus. If you want to see what makes God mad, you look at Jesus. If you want to see what, what God welcomes, you look at Jesus. And that is so interesting if you take it seriously. Because the people who just ticked Jesus off so bad were the religious leaders. And the people that Jesus was like so overcome with love for where the downcast and the outcast, this lady comes and breaks a bottle of perfume on his feet. A bottle of perfume that costs like a year's wages. And 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 uh, and the disciples are like, wow, that that was a waste. <laughs> that perfume could have been sold and we could have fed a lot of people with that. And that's not what Jesus says. His heart is overcome with this gesture of love. God is like, God's a poet. He, he looks at what she did and he's like, oh my gosh, she has done an amazing, amazing gesture of love. That's the heart of God. God's not an economist. God's a poet. That's what I would say. And, and, and this God that is trying to communicate to us has shown us the, the, the depth of his love by, sending, by, by coming in Jesus and walking so you can see how God really thinks and feels in ways that humans can understand. And then he died on the cross to show us just how much he loves us. And that's the God in whom we claim to, to have faith. And it's the God that the Holy Spirit reveals to us and calls us to believe in and entrust our lives in. To have faith in. To have faith into. So how do we get this faith? How does this faith grow in our lives? Well, on one hand, it's a gift. You, you, can't, you can't just walk up and to the faith store and take a couple more scoops of faith for this week. But you can do things that bring the growth of faith in your life. You can cultivate it like a garden. When, when you do a garden, you plant a garden, you don't, you, don't, you don't plant seedlings and pull on them every day to make them bigger. You just sort of do the things that need to be done and then the seedling grows. You cultivate it. And that's what we do with faith. If you want more faith, you can't just go get more faith, but there are things you can do in the soil of your soul that will cultivate the growth of faith. Those are uh, um, Christian disciplines. How, if you have someone that you, you want to build trust with, how do you do that? Do you just choose to trust them? I guess there's a little bit of that, but you spend time with them. You sit with them, you talk to them, you get their uh, counsel on things, you try their advice, you find out it's trustworthy, so then they tell you something else and you try that, and then after a while, you get this trust relationship going, and something really odd happens, and then they tell you to do something that really seems crazy, and but you've had so much trust with them over the years, 
that when the crazy thing comes up, you're willing to do it because you know they know what they're talking about. For instance, if you're turning left and your car starts to slide, what way should you turn your steering wheel? Right, yes, that's right. You've got to turn it the opposite way. If you're turning and your car starts to slide, you actually have to turn the steering wheel the opposite way to keep it in control. But almost, almost everybody has to be told that by someone who already knows and learn it by someone they trust and then try it then find out, oh, that is what you do when it slides. So learning to trust uh, comes, the culminating of that is spending time with the one who is trustworthy. That's, that's where the shepherd thing comes in. Jesus says he's our shepherd and we are his sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Spending time with the Father. That's the way our faith grows. Delight yourself, the Bible says, in the Lord. And He will give you what? The desires of your heart. How many would like to have the desires of your heart? <laughs> the desires of your heart, right? I mean, that's the, it's like the definition. Well, guess what? Here's how to have it. What's the caveat? Where does your heart have to be? With the Lord. So, if you want a heart that is filled with, with having your desires, having the, having the desires of your heart being filled up, the place to do it is to spend your time with the Lord. Spiritual disciplines, um, prayer, being here today, those kind of things. I just want to recommend a book to you. If you've never read this book, you can get it for a few books, a few bucks on. Uh, Amazon used. I think I got this one for three bucks. That's not because it's worthless. It's because it's ubiquitous. There's a billion of these out there. It's called the Celebrate Celebration of Discipline. And it's just a very simple, clear book. It's a modern book. It's not by some, you know, ancient father. And it just, it, in a very simple way, filled with anecdotes and everything, goes through meditation, prayer, fasting, study, Simplicity, solitude, submission, service, confession, worship, kindness, and celebration as the spiritual discipline of the Christian life. And, and if you want your faith to grow, don't just go, grow, faith, grow. That would be like pulling on plants to make them grow. What you need to do is cultivate the soil in which faith grows, and that's these things that are delighting yourself in the Lord. So you can take a look at that after the service if you want. Someone can even borrow my copy if they want. You can have my copy if you if you're going to use it, take it. I'll go get another one. It's the connection to God that that puts us in this world where faith, is, where where we see everything as part of what God's doing in our lives. Jesus said, "I am the vine; you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing." If you want your faith to grow, you have to cultivate the soil of your faith and do things that require faith. Test the Word of God. Take some of those words of Jesus and put them into practice and see if they don't make a difference in your life, in your relationships, in the way you feel about what's going on in your life. We'll find that Jesus is trustworthy. That is faith. Entrusting all to God. Because He is our shepherd. We are the sheep. And we know that He is the best in His heart for us because of what He's done for us in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank You for revealing Yourself to us in Jesus Christ. Father, if we just had to try to figure You out from the universe... But we know a lot about you. We know how vastly powerful and creative you are. We know that you you love beauty and complexity uh, and uh, and order. But we would, if we had to just look at the universe to figure you out, we would never see love and grace and redemption and forgiveness. 
And so we are so profoundly grateful that you'll reveal yourself to us in a person, Jesus Christ, who himself called him, called it, who called himself our shepherd. Father, we look to Jesus, our shepherd, to learn how to live. We look to Jesus, our shepherd, who gave his life for us in thanksgiving, faith, that a now our relationship with you is one of peace because of what Jesus did. And now we ask that you give us faith to trust your words and trust yourself with our lives. Help us believe into you, Father. Help us to, to let our, our lives and our souls just tie into you so that all things are, are seen as within your hands. And we just operate in trust and peace and follow you in everything. Not with anxiety, but with peace that passes all understanding knowing that our lives, our souls, and all that we have are in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen.